So looking at the minor prophet um, Micah, um, I was here on Friday night um, as we had a talk about the Baha'i faith and having prepared for this morning, I was really interested to hear how much Hassan, who was speaking to us, quoted from the book of Micah. If you want to hear that talk or see it, it's available on YouTube and on our website. Um, so you can go to our website to find it and I'll put the link in the, um, in the weekly update in the week ahead. In common with the other minor prophets, Micah is quite short, it's seven chapters. It's too long for us to read today all, all at once, but it doesn't take long in itself to read. And it has a number of very famous passages in it, very well-known words. Um, those words of the Lord to, that are beating swords into plowshares, that comes from the book of Micah. A very famous prophecy of the Lord's coming. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come a ruler. We know this so well from the Christmas story. These are the words that are read to, to Herod um, at the visit of the wise men in Matthew's Gospel. And then also the idea that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. These are words of Micah, among others. Um, in previous months when we've looked at the, the minor prophets, we've talked about the geography of the land. We've talked about the division that took place between Israel and Judah after the reign of Solomon. And, and this seems to have set off a, a, you know, all sorts of troubles and, and difficulties. Well, what I want to do today, rather than dwell so much on that, is to dwell on the history of this, this time and these two nations together. So I've taken two charts. This is from um, the Jehovah's Witnesses. So you can find this on jw.org. Um, and the reason I've chosen it, it's very simple. You get a lot of these charts on the internet that have just have far too much information on them, but this one's nice and simple. Um, it covers approximately 200 years for each of these two pages. Now, don't take the dates shown on this as particularly authoritative. I've seen a number of different charts that have different slightly different years. So this one, for example, begins in 997 um, BC, whereas some I've seen are 930. So there's some debate about the exact dates, but a lot of the information that he is here is correct. What you have on this chart, on the left-hand side, you have the kings of Judah, and on the right-hand side, you have the kings of Israel. And between, they show the prophets, so I want you to notice you can see Elijah and Elisha and their ministries there recorded in the books of Kings. But then as we look down at the bottom of the page, so after 850 before Christ, we see three of the minor prophets here noted. In, and it's their approximate dates of ministry. So I will mention about these three that Amos... We, we can date Amos reasonably easily because of references in the book of Amos itself, but it's not possible to do it quite so easily with Joel and certainly not with Jonah. There's nothing really in the book of Jonah that attaches the ministry and, and the message of Jonah to a particular time. So when you come to a chart like this, this is an approximation. This is the next 200 years. And you can see, if you look at the middle, again, um, you've got the, the kings of Judah on the left and the kings of Israel on the right. You've got the prophets in the middle, and there's two groups of prophets. But I just want to note two particular cataclysmic events which took place. So on the right-hand side, you can see that that list of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel is cut short and it's cut short by the attack of the Assyrian Empire. So they sweep into the northern half of the land, they capture the people, and they try and attack Jerusalem and fail, and they retreat. And so that really spells the end of the northern nation of Israel. And you can see that the, the kingdom of Judah continues on for some time. 
And the second cataclysmic event is at the end of that uh, reign of Zedekiah there, and that is the Babylonian exile. Okay? Now, what this doesn't show is the fact that after this 70 years of exile, that the nation of Judah is re-established and there is another little knot of prophets that occur that are writing in the time when the nation has been re-established. So I'll let you think about what are the prophets that are missing from these lists here and they are the ones that um, are, are working in the, in the post-exilic era. I want to go back to look at Micah. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. So you can see Micah is up here at the top of the chart. He is a contemporary of Isaiah and Hosea, working at a very similar time. Now it's possible for us to, to pinpoint that because of what Micah says about his own, his own book, his own prophecy. So right at the beginning of Micah, we have these words. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And you see, those words pinpoint when Micah was working and when Micah was writing. So we can place him fairly accurately. But I also want you to notice that he says the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. The way that they've set this chart up is that they've put the, the prophets that are speaking to Judah on the left and the prophets speaking to Israel on the right. So you can see Hosea is on the right because he spoke to the northern kingdom of Israel. I actually wouldn't put Micah where he is. I would put Micah in the middle because it says quite clearly the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, the capitals of both nations. So Micah speaks to both. He sees the destruction of Samaria at the hands of the Assyrians and he prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. And then he contrasts it with that lovely passage that we read earlier, um, beginning of chapter 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. That's in contrast to Samaria and Jerusalem, both of which were established on mountains. Okay. Um, there are three themes running through the book. I'll have the next slide, thank you. The first is injustice. Um, Micah, like Hosea, like Isaiah, working in that period of time, it's a time of great prosperity and wealth. The, both nations are doing very well. But it's also a time when people start to lose sight of religion. They start to lose sight of what it is the Lord is asking of them. And one of the things that they do is they are losing sight of the way that they ought to treat the other people in the nation. So it's all, and look, we're familiar with this these days, aren't we? We, we see the great imbalance of wealth and poverty. And in some cases we see the the depths to which people will stoop to increase their own personal wealth. And this is what Micah is seeing in his own time. The second um, theme that we see running through this book is idolatry. Yes, thanks, Pam. And so we note as we read um, through the prophecy of Micah, and you might have heard it in chapter 3, um, reference occasionally to graven images and, and idols and idolatry. But I want to link it very closely to the third problem that Micah highlights, 
and that is externalism. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Externalism. You know, we think of idolatry as setting up a little statue, you know, putting it on an altar and worshipping that statue. An idol or a carved image, which is just basically a lifeless and powerless thing. That's what we imagine idolatry to be. But what I want to say is any external ritual that loses the, the reality that it ought to focus our attention on is just as much of a problem as worshipping a statue. Now, we read these words. I want you to notice verses 6 and 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Now, that's all stuff that we find commanded in the Old Testament law. Those are rituals the Lord commanded. But then look what happens as we follow on. Shall I offer the firstborn for my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now that is not commanded in the Old Testament law. That contravenes the Old Testament law. And yet these are grouped together here in this prophecy. You see, if we offer a, a, rit a ritual of religion which doesn't have the heart in it, it's just as bad as the idolatrous practices of things like child sacrifice. I've been reading, as many of you know, reading through Arcana Celestia and um, Heavenly Secrets, and I'm just now coming into uh, Exodus chapter 32, where Moses has received all the commands of the Lord on the mountain, and he's coming down and he's seeing the idolatry that the children of Israel have fallen into. And at that point, what Swedenborg says is he says it's basically it reflects the failure to see anything spiritual within the literal sense of the word. It's a mere externalism. And, and Swedenborg ties idolatry and externalism together. They're two sides of the same coin. So in chapter 3, which we read, I, what I see here most fundamentally is an attitude to divine truth. And it's one that derives from a self-focused life. So I've quoted these words here from verse 5. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. It's the New International Version um, translating those words. So this idea of you know, a prophet for hire, telling us what we want to hear. And it's not only true of the prophets, it's true of the people they're speaking to as well. So we see people picking and choosing what they speak and what they hear. So, you know, we love all the words of comfort, the promise of protection, of favour, of being special, but we ignore the challenges of truth which actually point out something in our lives that we should be doing differently. And, th and this is the same. This is the same problem. And aren't we quick in our modern world to proclaim false, fake news, fake news, when we hear something we don't like. So, from these three problems, injustice, idolatry and externalism, we have three results. The first one 
is destruction. And you might have heard it in chapter 3 as I read, as I read chapter 3. I'll pick out a couple of verses. First of all, verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. And later on, verse 6 and 7. Therefore night will come over you without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. And then verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be ploughed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. So that destruction is the natural consequence of these three problems that Micah highlights. But then inexplicably, there are two other things to mention. Thanks, Pam. The first is restoration. We see in Micah, and we read those words from chapter 4, this idea of the, the restoration of the Lord's mountain. And we also see this, the other theme which is tied with it, which is the last, thanks my darling, that last one, which is the remnant that we spoke about last week. And in chapter 4, verse 6, here's how he describes this remnant. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. So what's really interesting is that it, I, I said it was inexplicable, the, the restoration and the remnant, because these are nothing to do with the people. This is the power of the Lord being displayed in the history of the people. There's no cause in what the people do that bring about this restoration. If we follow our own will and our own desires, the thing that we end up with is just destruction and the story ends there, it cuts off. There's, there's nothing more to be said. But it's the power of the Lord that, which brings about this restoration of the, of the nation. And then, of course, ultimately we look beyond that to the coming of the Lord himself, um, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at this remnant, he, he talks about the lame and the outcast. This remnant, they're not the rich and the powerful. They're not the ones with all the money and the resources. They're, it emerges out of kind of the, the, the dregs, the leftover bits of the nation. And that's where we see the power of the Lord working, in the weak and the disadvantaged and the despised. All right, I'd like to think about what lessons we draw from Micah. We have an odd relationship with the truth. We think often of ourselves of, as though we are defending the truth. And I wonder if you've ever heard that phrase, de a defender of the truth. The thing is for me that truth is reality. I don't need to defend reality. Reality just is. It's like saying I have to defend the light. I don't have to defend the light. The light just is. And I see by virtue of the light or not if my eyes don't work properly. So whilst we're very good at thinking of ourselves as defenders of the truth, in reality what we ought to be doing is using the truth to see. 
And that's really our job. You know, Jesus said, first remove the plank in your own eye to see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's. Our first job is to see and nothing else. And so when we approach the word, when we look at our experience of life, when we speak to other people, the question we have to ask if we don't like what we hear is, well, is it true? Is what I'm hearing true? Now, if it is, I ought to take it to heart and learn something from it and be glad that I was given that gift. And if it's not true, what should I do? I simply put it aside. It's not true. It's of no consequence whatsoever. And so that for me is the lesson of Micah, is our relationship with the truth. We are not defenders of it. We are beneficiaries of the light.